it's my pleasure um, to have our keynote now. We're going to have Bill Nicholson come up from PGE to introduce uh, John D. Carter. And uh, Bill is a senior vice president um, at PGE, and he handles customer service and customer strategies and business development. He's involved in a number of community organizations and currently serves on the boards of Associate Oregon Industries and Oregon Best. And we're pleased to have him here to introduce John. Thank you. Thanks, Allison. It's great to be here today, and especially great that the, the lights are on today. Uh, our crews worked long hours the last uh, few days, uh, going back to the weekend, and uh, we're, we're pleased that the lights are back on today. I'm also pleased to say that there were no employee injuries as we were restoring power to what amounted to more than 100,000 customers that were out of power over the last few days, and uh, many here in Gresham and East Multnomah County, Clackamas County. So thank you for your patience. If you were out of power, it is a reminder to all of us how important it is to the lifeblood of our home life and our business life. So uh, I'm really happy that the focus of this summit is uh, our urgent need to build and train the um, uh, workforce that we need, both to sustain our business and to, to grow our businesses. It's Certainly a focus at PGE, as Paul was talking about the demographics of some of our businesses. Portland General Electric is right in there. I think our average age is just under 50 years old, and a third of our employees we expect to retire within the next five to eight or so years. And we're especially concerned about finding replacements, especially in those areas of, of skilled craft workers like linemen and, and wiremen and, and, and some of those kind of things. Uh, so I do want to commend you for taking up this critical topic today. Uh, there's probably no single issue more important to our success um, in economic development than filling this pipeline. Our keynote speaker today, John Carter, uh, actually he wears two hats, one as business leader and also one as economic policy leader. And first, he's chairman of the board for Schnitzer Steel, which is a company that employs about 3,600 people. And they've also been a leader in sustainability. And uh, probably going back to the days 100 years ago when Sam Schnitzer uh, realized that scrap metal isn't junk, but it's, a, it's an important resource. Uh, and in many ways, Schnitzer does the same thing today that they did 100 years ago, but certainly now it's not just low tech. There's, there's high tech um, uh, technology that they're dealing with, and they need skills workers. They're also competing internationally. So Schnitzer is one of Portland General Electric's largest and most important uh, uh, customers and an, an important contributor to Oregon's traded sector economy. Um, John's also chair of the Oregon Business Plan, and um, that's a, a public-private partnership, as many of you know, that uh, is, is working to grow a sustainable economy throughout Oregon. Probably John could have been a keynote speaker last year at this event when the topic was sustainability, uh, because Schnitzer really um, has its roots in sustainability and has really been working on a lot of, ec of, of uh, uh, energy efficiency programs over the last few years that has made them uh, help both their bottom line and the environment. John is a busy guy. He's, uh, besides being Schnitzer's uh, chairman, he uh, serves on many boards, and a few of those include um, the board of Northwest Natural Gas, Fleur Systems, and Cooney Automotive. He's also a graduate of Stanford University and Harvard Law School, and uh, I'd like to welcome and uh, appreciate John being here today. Uh, thanks very much for the generous introduction. I think uh, you know, one thing you left out is I grew up in a Wheaton cattle ranch in Pendleton, Oregon. Uh, the uh, it's, it's very nice to be here today because this has been a great program already. Uh, I've learned a lot, and uh, it, it really emphasizes one of the challenges of being the keynote speaker midday. Uh, <clears throat> a lot of the notes in the song have already been played. <clears throat> so uh, uh, bear with me. We'll uh, adapt as we go, but I think you've, you've, uh, you've learned a lot as well. I certainly have. I confess to being a baby boomer by 37 days. But I have a lot of traditionals <laughs> in me, as you will find out. <clears throat> and, uh, and, and it's been an interesting, uh, it's been an interesting uh, last 25, 30 years to see how things have changed. I, I actually feature in a book as one of the guys that doesn't get it uh, in the e-boys revolution in Silicon Valley. 
Uh, it had, it was at the time when we were working with a company that many of you have never heard of called Webvan. that was a grocery delivery service on the internet. And uh, they wanted us to do it for equity. And we said we'd do it for cash. Uh, so we built out about a billion dollars worth of facilities for them and they went bust. Uh, they had the equity, but it wasn't worth anything, but we actually did quite well. So it worked out okay not to be one of those guys that got it. Um, the second thing I, I, would, uh, I would point out here is uh, I'm gonna really be focused a little, I'm not an expert in the area of human resources like the people that have been up here today, but I am gonna be focused on things that uh, are really pertain to the Oregon metropolitan area for the most part. Uh, those things that are in the Oregon business plan that we've spent a lot of time and effort on having to do with trying to match what we produce in the educational system to what our businesses actually require uh, in their daily work. Um, my, my background on that is all simply from experience. And I, I could say I've managed companies with one employee to those that have had 250,000 employees. So uh, somewhere in there, I've probably run into most of the things that people have to deal with on a daily basis. Uh, the, the topic about the revolution is kind of an interesting one because there hasn't been a lot of discussion about what that revolution really is. And I think there's a, uh, a, a reason to spend a moment or two about what we, what we actually think is going on in the workforce and why at least some people look at it as a revolution. Um, there's a lot of information on demographics that you've seen. There's a lot of information about, uh, Stacy did a great job of outlining uh, information about generations in the workforce. And sometimes, you know, when you get that much information dumped on you all at once, you feel like one of the wise men of my generation, Hunter S. Thompson, um, <laughs> that you're lost, but you're making good time. <laughs> So uh, there are some obvious questions raised by the topic. Let's see if I can make this thing work. Um, and the, the, the issue foremost is, do we actually have a revolution? What is it and what can we do about it? Uh, I also want to spend a minute in terms of the Oregon business plan to talk about uh, some of the things that are still very important. There were some comments and questions earlier about the role of manufacturing in the traded sector in our economy. And I think there are still some misapprehensions about uh, how much hasn't changed in terms of what really drives the economy in the, in the state. Uh, so I'd like to talk about this first slide about per capita income. Uh, these are just some background informational things, but they tend to be a little dramatic. If you look at this slide, I, I hope you can see it, uh, what it really tells you is that Oregon uh, continues to trail and indeed is on a declining curve from the national average on per capita income. That's not a good thing, obviously. But it's also in contrast to our sister state across the river who continues to maintain uh, a level above the national average. Uh, I think there's some things behind that uh, and maybe we can see a little more of why that's happened during the course of uh, the day. The second thing is that while our growth trend in Oregon is now positive, we still have a long way to go to get back to pre-recession levels. Uh, we've, we've got a lot of attention being paid how things are recovering, people starting to feel better, all that's great, but uh, the road's a long one. The other thing is kind of interesting, and this is from probably too small for you to see, but f fundamentally this gives you a contrast from 1992 to 1999 or eight, and then the, the current 2012 numbers. It's interesting, or this is from, this is Oregon specific, and it's from the Oregon uh, State Office of uh, Economic Analysis. And what it tells you is actually the aging workforce problem in Oregon is a lot in the public sector. And that's one of the reasons why a lot of emphasis 
is being placed on the issues uh, about retirement obligations, the, the PERS issue and other retirement obligations in the public sector, because it is a, it is a serious problem for this state that doesn't necessarily match what uh, demographics show in other states. And so it's, it's kind of an interesting thing for us. And then uh, one of the things that's kind of also, I think, quite interesting, there's been a lot of commentary about how the middle class has missed out uh, on economic growth uh, over the last several decades. Well, it's not quite true. In the Clinton and Bush years, the middle class actually did rather well in terms of increasing per capita household income. The problem has been since 2008. And uh, that tends to really focus again on why is it that we're not creating those kind of uh, middle class, middle income jobs in this recovery out of the recession uh, in the same way that we have in, in past recessions. So if I were to look at the national picture, again, it's sort of similar to the Oregon picture. There's still some ways to go before we get back to where we were on employment. But, and you've seen a lot, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but you've seen a lot of information that goes back to the prior slide as to why the employment recovery out of this recession is actually quite different than it has been in past recessions. Lots of part-time employment, lots of other things that they do not bring the average family income up to a level that you would expect at this phase in a post-recession recovery. So in Oregon uh, and the Oregon Business Plan, one of the things that is our primary focus is job creation, and that's job creation in the private sector. So we think a lot about what is it that really uh, business needs in order to be successful in the state. And there's a lot of ways you can come up with different lists. Uh, this, I think, these five things uh, really show up on everybody's list. There may be additions and subtractions and deletions from most people's list, but they, uh, they are pretty core to a successful business strategy. So let's uh, take a look at these success factors and see pretty much uh, how we're doing on them, because they are things that are uh, core to the Oregon Business Plan's efforts to restore and restart the circle of prosperity is what we have called it. Uh, it really is uh, the stimulation of jobs and higher income, smarter spending in the public sector, which includes uh, reforming public sector uh, in, in the sense of uh, how we spend our money on education and how we spend our money on uh, benefits, and, uh, and then increasing investments in education. Um, the investments in education scorecard actually has been quite good uh, in this last legislative session, and uh, we'll return to make a few comments about that. But from the standpoint of the Oregon Business Plan, one of our key objectives, and we have a, a sheet that lists 15 of them, is, um, is the Workforce Initiative, which is very closely related to the Education Initiative. So you need to have a motivated workforce with the skills needed for the business application that you have. And what's different about our workforce here in Oregon? And I ask the question again rhetorically, is there actually a revolution in, uh, in that workplace that has fundamentally changed the workforce? There may be a revolution. And that revolution may be on both the employer side and the employee side. It really affects the jobs equation because it's about two things. It's about attitude and it's about skills. So let's spend a minute on work ethic and attitude. And you heard some general characterizations about the generational attitudes about work ethic. But in a disturbing way for Oregon, there is certainly a change in the work ethic and attitude of our younger members of the eligible workforce. Uh, some of them are obvious and some of them are more subtle. And again, I reiterate uh, my disclaimer of being a human resources expert, so if I uh, don't use the proper terms, please, please forgive me. But I do see that uh, in terms of 
two things. One is the motivational attitudes and skills that our potential employees in the Oregon workforce now have. And the second one is the skills that the modern economy and our manufacturing sector require from potential employees. And in Oregon, we really have a growing mismatch. Um, why do I say that? Well, in Portland, at least, and not in Gresham, I'm sure, there is a, uh, yeah, there's clearly a large component of our young people who are not embracing the idea that joining a company and working hard for a long career is the path to success. That would be fine, really, in, an, in a dynamic economy and would be a positive interest if, in fact, they were all entrepreneurial and wanted to go out and create their own additions to economic growth uh, by starting companies in places like you know, Route 128 outside of uh, Boston or in Silicon Valley or in Austin. That actually is what happens. There's, there's actually this generation's attitude about careers has translated into a very, very fertile startup economic environment. Probably the problem in Portland is that they don't. We have university graduates working as coffee baristas or camping outside of City Hall with no apparent motivation to join the steady workforce. It's not even clear that the objective of a good job to support a family is as accepted by our workforce today as it was in our generation. And there really are some, some uh, uh, demographic reasons for that. If you look at this slide, it's hard to see, but the thing I can point out to you is that the number of married couples without children has not changed much since 1970, the percentage in, in, in the population, which is quite interesting, actually. What has changed is married couples with children. It's, it's gone down by half. That, uh, in our generation, was the classic driver of the workforce, is you got to go out and get a job to support your family. And if you look at it and you see what's changed, what you see is half of that classic workforce driver is gone. And where did it go? Well, it's gone to households that are non-traditional, single parents, people living alone, things of that nature. And that is very difficult to have the same sort of work ethic and motivational factors involved as you did in a traditional family. I don't know that, that people have actually focused so much. There's been a lot of conversation about how uh, married people with, with children have, have declined over the years, but I don't think it's, a lot of people look at that as people who have gotten married and don't have children. Well, they still have motivations to support each other. It's the other group that's grown the most that has created a lot of the problem. So in the Portland uh, area, there's the additional complication of being an attractive place for young people to go, as someone said, to retire. Um, <laughs> and there seems to be a lot less career achievement uh, uh, drives than there are in other places. And while we've had significant in-migration of college graduates, which shows up if you look at statistics, it says we've got a very highly educated workforce. Well, the problem is, they didn't come here for careers, they came here for the lifestyle. And so we're not getting the benefit of that education in terms of creating jobs and economic growth in the Portland metropolitan area. You know, we, we look at it and, and we say, why is that? Well, over the course of the last uh, X years, the, the value of technical education uh, despite all the rhetoric about how important it is, has really diminished in the eyes of these potential employees. They simply did not opt into those STEM courses when they were in school, if they were even offered. And some of our schools compounded the problem by not insisting in the kind of well-rounded, uh, what I would call both science, technology, and liberal arts education that many of us had the benefit of. Uh, so they come out with a totally different attitude about what's important. They also have this lifestyle point. Uh, the idea of work interfering with weekend plans, vacation, 
or even dinner plans, is uh, increasingly alien to this group. Uh, well, that's okay. It's a lifestyle choice, as we all say. The only problem is that uh, we don't live in a biosphere, and the world competition that we have to meet as businesses hasn't made that choice. They've actually made the choice, uh, my good friend George Schultz used to say, when Ever he got depressed, he'd go to Asia, because if he were in Hong Kong and China, he'd see a 1950s work ethic at, at, at play. And, uh, and I think that uh, that's a real problem for us. Uh, you can talk about it, as somebody did earlier, in terms of uh, a war or things that, you know, you, you can apply different labels to it. But the most difficult problem is productivity. I mean, what at the end of the day, what's going to happen here is either we change that or we figure out a way to continue to invest in productivity on the technology side and abandon those fields where technology isn't going to lift you above the rest of the world. So um, as I've often said, we've, we've raised a generation that believes that the only place you break a sweat is LA Fitness. <laughs> now our generation toyed with the idea of revolution. We, we called it the dropping out revolution. There are some other words for that, but we'll stick with dropping out. <laughs> uh, but, it, but the economy in those days was growing so strongly that uh, there were still jobs for everyone when we finally came to our senses. Uh, and the interesting thing is, Many of the most radical people in our generation got caught up in the technology boom and ended up working much harder than their parents ever did. Uh, my classic cases are the, uh, the Berkeley free speech movement leader, Mario Savio, who ended up as an insurance salesman in Walnut Creek. Uh, and then there was the Harvard College dropout who founded some company called Microsoft. So <laughs> for a group of younger working age people in Oregon, there's really an unhelpful revolution in attitudes. And we need to figure out a way to address that. But that's not everybody in that group. And what we are doing at the business plan is focusing on how we can make the, the, the business atmosphere better for the rest of that group that actually wants to, to go on and have a career and, and, and learn things and work hard. So uh, let's turn to the revolution in skills and expertise. Is there one there? Well, I think there is. And I think we've actually, our, our cultural and educational system have failed on both ends. On the lower end, and we haven't heard much about that today, but we need people who have skills in trades and craft. We need people that fill what is a core part of the manufacturing base in this state. They don't all have to be PhDs, and they don't all have to be programmers. Uh, and we don't do that kind of training to the degree that we used to do it. You know, it, it, for those of you who are old enough to remember, Benson was actually founded as a technical school. Um, and and we've, we've got to get more emphasis, and we are, and that's part of what the Oregon Business Plan is doing. We have to get more emphasis on those kind of technical skills. And there were comments about working with the community colleges that Boeing's doing, and, and I think I think that's a, a good step in the right direction, but we've got a long way to go there. Uh, again, because of the aging workforce. Uh, the second thing is that um, on the other end of the scale, uh, and I don't know how to, I don't know how to say this really um, in a politically correct manner, mm -hmm. but we don't, we seem to have the idea that a college education creates skill sets that are valuable. We're busy proving that's not true. Um, we have a lot of our educational institutions, and again, what you'll see in, the, in, in these boards that have been created by the, the legislature and the governor in this last session, you'll see this being addressed. But we have a lot of educational institutions that are producing graduates to do things that are not needed. Um, this happens, you know, it happens from time to happen when I was in college at Stanford. Uh, one of the things I used to, it, people don't remember at Stanford used to have a limit on the number of women in the schools, 10%. Um, 
a lot of fun things with that, but I won't go there. <laughs> but uh, the, uh, the places where a lot of women had, took classes were in classics. And so I was a classics minor. Um, and uh, <laughs> one, of, one of the things that was interesting is the, the classics department uh, graduated 34 people that year, and there were two jobs in the United States. Stanford graduated 34. I don't know how many Harvard and Yale and the rest of the guys did, but there were only two jobs in the whole United States. I mean, that's wrong unless people make those choices knowingly when they go in. And you see that now. I mean, you can see that, that, that the, uh, the problem exists in terms of people suing law schools because they promised them jobs. You know, I mean, you see that reaction coming up. We have that problem in Oregon. Um, turning out putative engineering groups from Portland State that are <coughs> sustainability engineers um, is an interesting concept, but let's find out how many jobs exist for that particular degree. Uh, and there are a lot of great stories about that, which offline might be fun to talk about, but uh, that's not what, that's not what uh, we need today. And frankly, computer fluency, technology expert, on this, this end of it, on the high end, on the graduates, college graduate end, is computer fluency, technology expertise, independent capability in managing massive amounts of data in a positive way. Social media communication applied to business, not Twitter and tweets, but applied to business in marketing and things of that. And they need to be matched with the more traditional skill sets that you would get in business, uh, like human resources and, um, and traditional management uh, skill sets. So, one of the things we appear not to need more of, but we continue to turn out, is uh, lawyers. Uh, and I speak as a lawyer, uh, but you could see that in terms of, of, of what's going on in the workplace. More nonspecific general business degrees, which are interesting but not necessarily useful. Uh, and more soft and fringe expertise in exotic niche areas. If, if there's not a job market for it, people that want to go into those areas need to know that before they go into it. Uh, this has a knock-on effect that's quite serious. The, the Oregon Office of Economic Analysis has published some studies that show that what happens is people who are overqualified then take jobs that require lesser skills and increase the pressure on those people in our, uh, in our economy who are minorities and less skilled workers, because those jobs are no longer available to them. They're filled by people who have an advanced degree in a TC5, you know, sex behavior. And <laughs> it's, not, it's, not a useful, it's not a useful application of, of what we are invested in in the, uh, in the educational area. So if we come back to it, we say, well, again, back to the manufacturing discussion, why is it that Oregon needs these technical skills. At an important core of our economy remains manufacturing. And that manufacturing, for the most part, is export-based. And that is the engine that drives at least 40% of our total great, uh, gross state product. Uh, that's, by the way, as a percentage of state output, that's the highest in the country. It would be uh, interesting to know how many people think about Oregon as being more dependent on manufacturing and export than any other state in the union. Um, the direct employment in manufacturing, and, and by the way, manufacturing goods are about 70 percent of the state exports. Uh, the port has some very interesting data on that. Uh, you, there, the next thing I was going to talk about is the knock-on part of the jobs. There's about, somebody said earlier, about 170 thousand manufacturing jobs in Oregon. Uh, my number is 168, but hey. And uh, <coughs> the, uh, 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 about 110,000 of those are in the Portland metro area. And what, what I look at and I see is that those jobs are the most likely jobs to increase over the next decade. And there are a number of factors we'll get to that, that really apply to that, but they're also the best jobs. They're jobs that average $70,000 a year 
That's about 20,000 or more above the other, the other average non-farm jobs in the state. So they're good jobs. Um, and it comes back to this point about manufacturing. I, I always like, some of you may remember T.J. Rogers, who was the Cypress Semiconductor founder. And he said something that I thought was actually pretty good. He said, if you're not, act, if you're not able to actually make the product, how can you expect to improve it or to build on it to create new products? And that's why manufacturing is important. It means, I mean, the U.S. still is 18.5% of the world's manufacturing capacity. We're still the largest manufacturer in the world. It's not China. And people fail to remember how important that sector is to our society. So how do we change this mismatch in our workforce? Um, both the governor and the legislature working with the Oregon Business Plan have done a lot this year for STEM education. Uh, they created a STEM Investment Council. There's uh, funding for that. Uh, there is a goal to double STEM qualified graduates by 2025. There's a lot of emphasis on re in improving uh, requirements for computer skills and math in high schools and in in uh, even in uh, primary schools, more career counseling, retraining, uh, and as was referenced earlier, a lot more on-the-job training programs that are encouraged by or sponsored by both companies and the state. Um, that's really important because it means that the exposure early on when career choices are made includes the option of going into the manufacturing sector. So, uh, is my concern or an emphasis on manufacturing important? Is this really, we've had all this conversation, is this really a so what issue? You know, we're, as somebody at one little talk I gave stood up and said, well, it's really, I'm, I'm more interested in what I'm doing with my pottery and it's really much more important than anything about manufacturing besides that it's better for the environment. Well, um, despite our fascination with the joys of living in this region, we still live in a competitive world, and the rest of the world hasn't adopted all these enlightened attitudes yet. And we need to produce these uh, skill sets. You know, p companies like Intel and Boeing have to go out of state to, to hire people because they can't get them out of the workforce here. And we've, you know, we're investing a lot of money in education. We need to have that investment produce what we actually use. Um, I look at uh, the, the way that we make choices for youth in terms of what they decide to pursue as a career uh, in our normal laissez-faire approach, it's interesting, but that doesn't help us compete in a global economy where we are. As, 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 as others have said, you know, we've let our students follow their muse, but their muse may just not be going anywhere. And uh, it, they need to understand that uh, those choices are lifelong choices. I mean, if you start out in an area that isn't going to get you anywhere, by the time you realize you're on that path, it's very difficult to change. It's very difficult to go back and pick up those skills when you're trying to be in an environment where you have to actually support yourself. Um, so let's turn to uh, the competitive cost structure and uh, component of a successful business and find out how we're doing in Oregon. Well, here we're doing better. For the most part, we remain a relatively positive environment on the cost side. Our, uh, w in, in addition to which, we combine that with what most people consider to be a very livable environment. Uh, not everyone mine, especially those people that have this uh, strange fascination with sunshine. But uh, <clears throat> it, is a, it is an attractive part of the state and uh, the, all of the things that we do outdoors, all of the great natural beauty we have and the resources we have do help us a lot overcome other things that are not quite so positive. Food and transportation costs in the state remain reasonable. 
we have big advantage in terms of the ports of uh, Portland and, and Vancouver. We have competitive uh, rail service, and the I-5 corridor provides good trucking access. Plus, we have a great waterway transportation system that most people don't think about much, but really serves us well, particularly for the inland areas of the state. However, one of our big advantages is, uh, is under siege. Uh, we have had a distinct advantage in energy costs uh, brought to us by our very efficient hydro system and very low cost hydro system. Why do I say it's under siege? Well, some of the reasons are internal and some are external. First, we have artificially increased the cost of our hydropower by loading it with social services. Um, well, that may be the appropriate public policy thing to do, and I'm not trying to address it from that standpoint. It does raise the base cost of hydropower to business in the state and to residences in the state. It didn't matter in the past so much because the higher cost of fossil power uh, was, uh, was enough to mask the gradual increase in hydropower. But there's a big change underway. Secondly, we're raising the cost of our baseload fossil power and reducing the efficiency of our hydropower by loading the system with inefficient alternative energy costs, primarily wind power. Now, before you get all lathered up about the blessings of alternative energy, let me assure you this is not an argument against it. It's just the facts about what it's doing to our historical cost advantage in, in the energy sector. And really, the most adverse to those costs, the most inefficient, the most costly, is wind energy. So what, you ask? I mean, that's what we want to do. So what? Well, the rest of our, con our, our country, including those states that compete with us, are enjoying a revolution in lower energy costs, courtesy of the shale oil and shale gas boom. Remember, no matter how much we'd like to think differently, the forecast is for our system, let me get this to move right, to remain out through 2040, 80% fossil. So that, and that forecast is actually probably understated because as new reserves come on and the lower cost of gas continue to, continue to grow, uh, the incentive for change into uh, alternative energy is going to diminish. So if you look at that, you say to yourself, um, why aren't we taking advantage of it? Well, part of the reason we're not taking advantage of it is because we don't access that low-cost gas. We haven't been able to build the pipeline across the state that will allow us to tap into those resources. Our gas comes from British Columbia. And while we've had some knock-on effect to the, to the prices of, of BC gas, um, it is dramatically different than what the gas prices are in the Midwest and the South in terms of what they're seeing as, uh, as gas prices delivered to both electric generators and to, and to industry in those areas. Um, this is really kind of amazing when you think about it. When I, when I retired from Bechtel back in 2002, North American gas production was falling. Uh, it was a worrisome thing. And that's Canada and the U.S., Mexico. In the U.S., dry gas production grew from 2005 to 2012 from 18 trillion cubic feet to 24 trillion cubic feet, and it's still growing. And there's still 1,500 wells in the Marcellus Shale that can't even get on pipelines. Um, the Utica Shale sites are going to add 46 percent to our gas production over the next year and 30 percent the year after that. So it's resurrecting manufacturing and petrochemical industries in South. So manufacturing, which is really dependent on energy costs, is going to be a boom business in the U.S. And the question is, uh, are we going to find a way to make sure that we get some share of that manufacturing growth because it's important to our economy? So what can we do about it? Well, one of the things we can do is we can build a pipeline. And I urge all of you in the business community to support that. Uh, it's insane from just a safety standpoint to have all of the gas to the region depended on one 50-year-old pipeline that comes down the gorge. Uh, but uh, I guess uh, 
redundancy and, and efforts to prepare ourselves for earthquakes are more important than actually having the gas go on and the lights continue. <coughs> but uh, we can do some other things that are actually uh, very interesting, which is we can become a leader in waste energy. I mean, this is an area which should fit our environmental agenda. It should fit uh, all of our sustainability goals. And right now, uh, it's a much better bet for us than windmills. Only 7% of U.S. energy production comes from waste streams. If you go to Germany, it's over 60%. If you go to Holland or other European countries, it's over 40%. And right now, it's in those countries, they don't have landfills because they use their waste streams for energy production. And the technology has moved to the point you can do that and actually have virtually no emissions of any kind from, uh, by using an electric arc furnace on the back end of a fluidized bed boiler. So that it's, it's ripe for us to do some things in that. The U.S. is behind in that. We can be a leader in that, and we can do that in a way that will help us from the standpoint of bringing on alternative energy, but at a reasonable price. But the bottom line at the moment is our cost uh, advantage in energy is withering. So let me turn for a moment to the third element of business success, which is infrastructure. Uh, right here we have kind of a mixed report card. We, we know from various government studies about the state of our infrastructure that we need billions of dollars to maintain what we have, let alone replace and grow what we need over the next uh, decade. And funding sources are, as they say in the trade, uncertain. Um, so what are we going to do about it? Well, some of you know that uh, there's been a group that was sponsored by Metro that has worked on, uh, called a Community Investment Initiative, that's worked on trying to come up with ways to attract capital to the region for infra infrastructure investment that is not simply displacing money that's already in the region uh, to, uh, on a priority basis. And uh, that regional infrastructure enterprise, or RIE, is uh, probably going to, you're going to hear a lot more about that between now and the end of the year. Uh, that's one area. Uh, Ted Wheeler at the state level is working on something similar, a uh, little less oriented toward new sources of funds but certainly a more efficient investment of funds we have and in coordination with our sister states. Uh, both things should be helpful. Uh, we've had a good, both through the last two governors, we've had good uh, support for Connect Oregon, uh, and the legislatures and has funded those programs that have helped us both, not only in terms of highway improvements, but mostly in terms of short line rail improvements. And rail main, it continues to be a very important part of our freight transportation system in the state. We do need the I-5 Columbia River crossing. You know, I, I uh, started work on that in 2001 uh, and presented a public-private deal when I was still at Bechtel to have that up and running in 2006. Uh, we didn't make that. Um, and the cost that we had on it was about half of what they're talking about today. And we predicted that what would happen if they didn't go that route uh, would be 10 years of delay and a couple hundred million dollars paid to consultants. Yes, well, <laughs> we <laughs> why is that important? Well, it's important for a lot of reasons. It's important because that is the gating piece of infrastructure between British Columbia and Los Angeles. Truckers plan their entire routes over the possibility of a lift on that span. It is the last lift span on the interstate system. It is also half that bridge sits on pine pilings that don't even go to any kind of rock structure. They're in the sand. It would take next to nothing in terms of a seismic event to, you know, maybe not dump the whole thing over, but it could freeze the lift span at some point, and then what do you do? 
There are no parts for that. They make parts for that. You know, you don't go out to the local Ace Hardware and buy replacement parts for the lift span. You know, they have to make all those uh, by uh, personal handcraft. And I, I look at the, you know, I've talked to politicians on both sides of the river. I said, you know, there was a real movement to replace the cypher structure in the Bay Area as an outmoded old system. And all the politicians had other priorities until it fell down and killed a lot of people. So I think, you know, we're at a kind of a seminal moment on this. I think we're actually going to get a program to do it from the Oregon side. Those people that uh, worry about Oregon taking on too much risk, from my perspective, it is actually less risk because you're only dealing with the politics of one state instead of two. And the finances are the same. The tolling revenues and the bonds and so forth are the same. So I hope that, uh, and there's a, you know, the governor's still on this track, so hopefully we'll get that done. You know, I often say our parents were wise enough to build our basic infrastructure with margin for future growth, and our generation has simply used that margin up without replacing it for our children and grandchildren. And we gotta do better. We just have to do better. So the fourth element here is uh, availability of capital for investment and expansion of business. Uh, our large businesses are doing fine. The low interest rate environment's helpful. But our smaller businesses and our venture capital environment's not very good. And part of the reason for that is our tax structure. Uh, our tax structure encourages wealthy retirees to leave uh, and to, uh, you know, the formation of capital investment pools in the Bay Area, for example, a lot of that is done on the basis of people who have retired from their businesses and put that capital to work. And in recent rankings, Oregon was the sixth most unfriendly state to retirees. It's a big deal. When, uh, when someone in Oregon retires, they think about moving to another state before they cash in their capital gains. And given the estate tax, when Oregonians over the age of 70 get a cold, they move. <laughs> they don't want to Even California doesn't have an estate tax, folks. I mean, it's really quite an interesting penalty that we impose on ourselves. And we need, we need that capital. We need that capital back into our state. And what, what you could see the effect. When our startups, we, we do pretty well on startups. I mean, it's a very fertile startup in our environment in our economy. But once they get to the point they actually need that second and third round of financing, they leave. They go to Seattle or San Francisco or someplace where there are pools of venture capital that can help them through that next tier of financing. And we've got to do better on that front. Our universities are doing better in terms of attracting funding for technology. Uh, but at the end of the day, we're still, uh, it's still tough sledding because we don't have national recognized universities on research and development, except with OHSU. And OHSU is a really good example of when you do it right, it really helps the local economy. Um, so I would say on that report card piece, we're, we're mixed. We're okay, but we could do a lot better. And then the last point is uh, regulatory environment and a, and a tax system. I already talked a little bit about the tax system in terms of its effect on capital formation, but in terms of its effect on our dependence on the income tax, that's a problem we have to address. And this governor appears to be interested in taking on that challenge. Um, and I think that uh, that challenge includes the property tax, where we've got really cheek by jowl unfairness. It takes on the point that we actually really need some kind of a consumption tax. You notice I didn't say sales tax. Uh, and the difficulty in, in, uh, in addressing those things is you have to do it as a package because if you take on any one of them, there's not enough trust in the voting populace to think that at the end of the day, you reform that, it ends up being a revenue producer or a revenue subtractor, and it's not gonna re reflect in some other component of the tax system. So it has to be a package, and I think I think if this governor decides to run again, uh, I think it's going to be high on the agenda for his second term. Uh, and the Oregon business plan is, 
is uh, is on that case. I mean that we we truly believe it's ne it's needed. And lastly, I think uh, on the regulatory side, I'd say there's two things that I would point out. One, you can see where land use planning decisions get made, there are success in new businesses locating. We don't do that well. We have a process loaded system. And uh, or sometimes our decisions take longer than the business cycle that a business wants to invest in. So if we can't make a decision on locating a new business in 18 to 36 months the way we do now and do it in a lot faster fashion, we're going to lose a lot of opportunity. And that's an area where we really do need to focus on trying to get these, as I, as I said, you know, the, the purpose of a per permitting agency is to issue a permit. And so, you know, we ought to change the metrics. Let's measure how many permits they issue. Uh, now, they can put conditions on it, as they should. They can do the due diligence on it. But we've got to stop this constant uh, you know, death by a thousand cuts that happens in our permitting process. We're the only state that allows court appeals from permitting processes that, that tie up the permit until the court session is resolved. That's it. We're the only one. So, uh, and, and then the other area is where we impose on ourselves uh, higher restrictions than are imposed on other states. And the best example of this is the EPA Superfund in the Portland Harbor. Um, and I, I declare self-interest in this because we are one of the PRPs at Schnetzer in the, in the harbor, as is the port. And frankly, as is all of you are because the utilities are all involved in this. So you'll have the opportunity to pay whatever the fair share is. The uh, situation in the Willamette River today is that it is a multiple cleaner than any other EPA Superfund site after cleanup. So it's not like we have some Love Canal situation. I mean, the, the, the cleanup of the, of the Hudson River, for example, that Senator Schumer knows a great deal about because he uh, changed a lot of the rules for it. Um, after they clean it up, it, it, its pollution level is uh, eight times what the ambient situation is on PCBs, for example, in the Willamette. There isn't a lot that needs to be done, but we all recognize that it's a good thing to do what needs to be done. And we need to get to the point where we've got metrics that make sense, not metrics that are wishful thinking. Right now, the way that the EPA is headed on that, it'll be about a $2 billion penalty on the businesses in the region, which the businesses in the region cannot afford, and uh, it will make decisions about whether they stay in the region. And it's, in a way, the difference between $300 million and $2 billion uh, in five years will be indistinguishable because the upstream ambient situation will more than overwhelm whatever work is being done and there's going to be a lot more damage done by the manner in which they do the cleanup with dredging than, uh, than the alternatives. So while I know this is kind of an arcane subject for most of you, the, the, the reality is it's going to become a lot more interesting over the course of the next couple of years. And I would urge you to inform yourselves on it. You may not have the same opinion about it that I do, but I'm very confident that if you do inform yourselves on it, it'll be darn close. So a lot of good work is being done by the state in the Oregon business plan. Uh, we should uh, be really happy with what we've accomplished on education. We should be a little concerned about our cost structure in the energy area in particular. We got to do better on infrastructure, and we're working on that. The tax structure needs to be uh, reformed, and hopefully that'll be part of the agenda for the next two years before the next uh, session of the legislature, full session. And we really do need to continue to focus on making life easier for businesses that want to expand or locate in the state on a regulatory and tax front. So I. Started out with a little humor and ended up far too serious. Um, <laughs> but thank you very much for your attention.
So we have a few minutes for questions, since I didn't actually overrun my time as I thought I did. So uh, anybody have anything they'd like to ask about? Anybody still awake? Yeah. You had mentioned the importance of manufacturing in Oregon. And uh, oh, sorry. Brian Lustler here. Uh, you'd mentioned the importance of manufacturing in Oregon, and I think uh, the potential growth of that nationwide. What we've heard and read and perhaps seen over the last several years is a kind of an export of manufacturing to lower cost labor markets. What's going to bring that back? How do we differentiate ourselves in this country uh, as a manufacturing node, if you will, uh, so that we can compete with those? I mean, we're never going to compete with, you know, Sri Lanka or Vietnam in terms of labor costs. So how do we compete, I guess, is the question. Well, I, I think that's a really good question. And there's actually, uh, there's actually some interesting answers to it. First, the big issue has been, of course, uh, cost. And uh, as I always say, uh, consumers export jobs, not companies. If you shop at Walmart and buy a hammer there, you send a job to China. So enjoy that experience. Um, but what's changed is that the developing country's cost structure on labor has changed dramatically in the last five years. It's just remarkable how much that's changed. So what that does, it throws back to the U.S. advantage in productivity. Better trained workers, better technology, better technology application. The big advantage and change is this energy cost. Um, this gives us an advantage over Europe gives us an advantage over uh, these uh, uh, developing countries because it overwhelms the labor costs. And then lastly, logistics have become much more important in terms of where the markets are. So the cost of getting goods to markets has uh, people, with, with what you've got, really everybody now, it used to be a you know, revolution, you had just-in-time delivery of inventory. Now everybody's in just-in-time. The steel business is in just-in-time inventory mode. So that means if you can, f if you can fill a need uh, on an immediate basis, you have an advantage that is very difficult to overcome by somebody in Sri Lanka. So the, the, you know, I'm not suggesting for a minute that there's going to be um, an overwhelming rush back, but the trend line is completely reversed. And you'll see investment in, you know, there was an article in the journal, I think, yesterday or today, about the investment of energy companies in Europe in the U.S. because they're trying to take advantage of the lower cost. Petrochemical business, which exited the U.S. in the 1980s, is now back. Um, the job growth opportunities are, are dramatic. Other question? Okay, well, thanks very much.